in the North Australian from November 7th, 1884. The following account could be found. Quote, About half past seven, on the evening of the 21st, we were in a thick fog, with whistle blowing. Our captain and the second mate were on the bridge, and a man was on the lookout on the forecastle head. Suddenly, we heard the fog horn of another steamer on our starboard bow, and in about five or ten minutes, we still hearing the horn, the stranger, a Spanish steamer, ran into us. End quote. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, The Deadly Chaos of the Hihong and Lexham? Here we are. Enjoy! The two ships that met in the fog off of Cape Finisterre had very little in common. The Lexham, under the command of Captain Lothian, was primarily a cargo ship, though on board for the voyage were two passengers, as well as the captain's wife and child. She was a 1,295-ton single-screw steamer, built in 1879 and sailing under the British flag. She was bound from Tagendrog, Russia, to Rotterdam in the Netherlands, with a cargo of wheat. In addition to the passengers and the captain, she also had a crew of 20 men on board. The Hihan was also a single-screw iron-hulled steamer, but a much larger one at 2,110 tons. Built in 1873 and owned by the Compañía Transatlantica of Spain, the Hihaun had been accepted for a government contract in 1883 for a government postal contract. She now had the role of carrying passengers as well as mail from Cadiz, Spain to Havana, Cuba. On the 21st of July, the Hihaun departed from A. Caronia, under the command of Captain D. Baldomero Iglesias, with 111 passengers on board, as well as a crew of 80, bound for Puerto Rico and then Cuba. The Lexham had been traveling slowly through the fog, with the watch on alert, and the captain and second mate also at the ready in case anything happened. For several minutes they had heard the sound of a whistle, and they had answered with their own but the fog was too thick to catch a glimpse of any light from any other ship, and it was disorienting enough that they could not tell where the sound was coming from. Just like the Lexham, on the Hihan, the officers, including the captain, had taken up their posts on the bridge due to their concerns about the thick fog. Not only that, but it was now around 8 o'clock at night, and the darkness, combined with a fog, was enough to put any commander of a ship on edge. For the first two hours of the Hihan's voyage from A Coruña, the ship had been traveling at her regular speed of about 12 knots, but they could see the fog on the horizon, and they were prepared for when they came to it. As they traveled into the fog, they reduced their speed to half and the Compañía Transatlantica would later say that this was as slow as it could have been practical for them to go without damaging their ability to steer well. Though the Lexham would say that they had been sounding their whistle the entire time, the people who would tell their stories later from the Hihaun would disagree that their own fog whistle had been blowing was of no dispute. There were many witnesses to that, both on the Hihaun and the Lexham. But the people on the Hihaun insisted that they only heard the Lexham's whistle respond to theirs as she passed close across their bow, far too late to stop. Whether the Lexham was blowing their whistle at regular intervals is uncertain and impossible to verify. That if she was and the people on the Hihaun somehow failed to hear it, is almost certain. For those on board the Hihaun, it was a horrifying moment as a side of a moving ship came into view directly ahead of them in the thick fog, and they heard the ship's whistle sounding its warning. The people on the Lexham were even more shocked. 
Most of them failed to see the Hihalan until it had already struck their ship. Both ships had discovered the position of the other one far too late. On both ships, the order was given to their engine crews to reverse, but there was far too little time for this order to have any effect on what was to come. The Hihaun was a much larger ship than the Lexum, and plowed into her midship on the starboard side, sinking deeply into the side of the cargo vessel. The Lexum was nearly cut in two. The collision rocked their ship and knocked the funnel over, which, in turn, burst the steam pipes scalding the engine crew badly. The Lexum only had three boats, and two of them were smashed by the Hihaun as it struck them, and the last one was smashed by the falling funnel. Some of the members of the Lexum kept their presence of mind enough to climb up the towering side of the Hihaun and reach her deck for thirty seconds or so that the two ships were still stuck together. No one on either ship doubted that the wounded Lexum would stay afloat for long, and the entire crew of the Lexum rushed to the deck to try to escape. Captain Lothar's first concern was the safety of his wife and child, and he quickly tied a rope around his family, and the men who had reached the deck of the Hihaun hauled them up. They then threw the rope back to Captain Lothar. Captain Lothar had been standing on the quarterdeck the entire time, but by the time it was his turn to be pulled up, the Lexum had sunk so quickly that, rather than being pulled from the deck, he was being pulled through the water. Almost the entire crew of the Lexum arrived on the deck of the Hihaun. Among those who had found themselves on the deck of the mail steamer was Captain Newton, who was traveling as a passenger on the Lexum. Captain Newton had been the captain of the Azelby, owned by the same owners as the Lexum, but ten days before had lost his ship by striking the rocks of Cape Sagers, Portugal, in a thick fog. He now found himself shipwrecked for a second time in the space of one month due to poor visibility. On board of the Hihaun, Captain Baldomero Iglesias ordered his third officer to prepare a boat to go and rescue the three people who it was known had been left on the Lexum's deck. As soon as the Lexum and the Hihaun had separated, the Lexum had sunk into the darkness and fog, which led many people from the Lexum to assume that she had sank as soon as the ships parted. The Hihaun seemed steady enough, though. The blow that had rocked the Lexum had hardly been felt on the Hihaun, and the Compania Transatlantica was very proud of the waterproof bulkheads and other safety measures that were in place on the Hihaun many of which had been added after they purchased her. Still, Captain Baldomero Iglesias also gave orders for his crew to make an assessment of the damages that the Hihan had sustained in the collision. The news that was returned after an inspection of the condition of the Hihan was much more grim than the captain could have expected. The bow plates of the Hihan had been smashed in the collision and water was rushing in. In the space of a few minutes, the people on board the Hihaun were able to feel the ship starting to settle under their feet, and they could hear the sound of rushing water entering her. Captain Lothian, who had only been standing on the deck of the Hihaun for a few minutes, but could feel it, and commented on it to another member of his crew, stating that there was going to be nothing for it but the boats. Captain Baldomero Iglesias clearly felt the same way, and ordered that the boats be launched, but the moment the order was given, chaos descended. Part of the issue was that the passengers had no assigned lifeboats, something that would cause public criticism later. Though, Campania Transatlantica would protest that many ships did not assign lifeboats with the sale of tickets, and so it was an unreasonable complaint. The Hihan's first mate was supposed to be in charge of ensuring that the women and children were safely placed in boats, but the madness that descended on the ship made this almost impossible. Soon, people were fighting over places in boats, and those who did find a place in a boat were forced to defend their spots with knives. 
The boats that did get launched were so full that the gunnels were only inches away from the water and in danger of being swamped. Captain Baldomero Iglesias did his best to control the situation, initially by simply giving orders, but later by walking through the chaos with a revolver. He was disregarded, however. The appearance of his revolver only served to create a rumor later that when the ship had begun to sink, he had put an end to it all with his weapon. Something that was published widely, condemning him as a coward who had acted badly and made the situation worse, even though this was later found to be far from the truth. Captain Baldomero Iglesias instead threw himself into trying to launch as many boats as possible, aided by members of the engine crew, while the first mate continued to try to save the women and children the best he could, and the second mate distributed the ship's plentiful life belts. At least once, Captain Baldomero Iglesias found himself on a boat as it was being launched, doing what he could to ensure everything went smoothly and the boat was able to escape. Though the people on board of the boat asked him to remain with them, the captain refused, however, and climbed back up to the deck of his sinking ship to see what else he could do. In the meantime, the third mate acted on the orders he had been given, and with the help of several members of the Hian's crew, as well as at least one member of the Lexham's crew, they launched the ship's small gig and headed to find the Lexham in the hopes of saving the men who had been left on her. They traveled into a thick, dark fog, which meant that soon they could see neither vessel, but the air was filled with the screams from the panicking people on the Hihaun, adding an air of horror to the night. The crew member of the Lexham, who was in the gig, was not actually certain how long it took them to find the Lexham. They were not certain what direction they were rowing in, or if the Lexham was even still afloat. The Lexham was still afloat, though barely, when they did finally discover her. Three feet of water was now over her foredeck, but when they climbed on board her, they were able to find their three remaining companions, one of whom was Chief Engineer Milton who had been the worst burned when the steam pipes had burst and was now writhing in agony, as well as a second engineer and the Lexham's first mate. All three men had been below deck when the collision had occurred, and so they had missed their chance to get on board the Hihaun. The engineers had been in the engine room, and the first officer had been off duty and asleep in his room. They brought the three men into the gig and began to row back to the Hihaun, only to hear the sound of the Lexham going down in the darkness behind them. They had reached her just in time, but she had lasted longer than many people had supposed. While many reports would later say she went down in three minutes, it is estimated that it took around 20 minutes for her to finally settle to the bottom. When they reached where they had left the Hihaun, though, they found that she was also gone, with only two of the boats from the Hihaun floating nearby, as a sign she had ever existed. The two boats were heavily loaded, and they were not the only ones to have escaped from the Hihaun, but the cost of life had still been appalling. In total, it was estimated that 130 people went down with the Hihaun as she sank, bow first. The horrified people in the boats could only watch, and the air was filled with horrified shrieks of the passengers who had not been able to find a place in one of the boats. In the final moments, the officers seemed to have realized that there was no time left, and they had done everything they could. They were seen gathered around their captain, arms folded, calmly standing on the quarterdeck as the ship went down, making no effort to escape. For all of the safety measures that the owners of the Hihaun were so proud of, the Hihaun and the Lexham had gone down mere moments apart. The boat that had gone back to save the people on the Lexham was soon separated from the other two boats by the rising wind that blew off the fog. For ten hours they floated, with the chief engineer Milton moaning from his injuries, 
and, complaining of intense thirst, they could offer him nothing to quench. They were finally spotted by the French steamer Ville de Valencia and picked up. They could only hope that the other boats had been as lucky. One of the firemen from the Lexham had a near miss. He had been in one of the lifeboats that had been launched, but it was so overloaded that he had jumped out of it into the sea and swam for another boat, which turned him away because they too were too heavily laden. He finally found a boat that had been launched by another member of the Lexham's crew, which only had about 30 people on board. They were able to pull him on board, but that did not mean that he or they were safe. The boat that they were in had no rowlocks, and so they were not able to make much progress, and they also had no way of knowing where they were going in the thick fog and darkness. It was not until noon the next day that the fog cleared up some. Around eight at night, they were able to see the Cape Finisterre light, and they headed towards it. Occasionally, they would see a ship and try to attract its attention, but with the intermittent fog still present, every ship failed to see them. It was not until noon on the 23rd, after having been at sea in the boat for a little over a day and a half, that they were able to attract the attention of the steamship Zoe, and they were brought on board, all of them at this point suffering from hunger and thirst. None of the boats had had a chance to take on any provisions. Sixteen more men were found in a boat by the brigantine Nelson Hewerton. A particularly heavily laden boat was rescued by the Santo Domingo, and fifteen people were saved from a boat by the schooner Vespertina Wilson. Neither Captain Lothian nor his family were among those saved, but many of the other officers of the Lexham were able to tell their side of events. As people were saved, they were brought to ports all over Spain, adding to the confusion about what had happened and how many had survived. The chief engineer of the Lexham, the man most badly injured out of the rescued, was quickly brought to a hospital but was not able to overcome his wounds, adding one more name to the list of those lost in the collision. Each person only had what they had seen to go by, adding to a flurry of rumors. As far as each boat was concerned, they were likely to be the only ones to have survived the entire ordeal. The papers published whatever they could get out of survivors. Lexham had sunk in three minutes. The captain of the Heehollen had been a terrible coward. And nothing had been done to save the passengers. The crew of each ship blamed the other ship for the collision, but most at fault, due to the harsh words of the passengers who had escaped to the newspapers, was found with the officers of the Hihaun. It was severe enough that the Campania Transatlantica took it upon itself to publish a finding to justify the actions of their ship and their crew. The captain and officers of the Hihaun had more than enough experience and blameless records, the company pointed out. They also pointed out that, even with his own ship sinking, Captain Baldomero Iglesias had still ordered the third mate, the only officer to survive from the Hihaun, to go save the people who remained on the Lexham. That was not the actions of someone who did not care about human life. The Compania Transatlantica was also quick to bring the passenger, Captain Newton, into their argument. He was found guilty of losing his ship through negligence in the fog, with his ship owned by the same people as the Lexham. Did this not point to a company culture of poor management in low visibility? They were not willing to flat out accuse the Lexham of not having employed their fog whistle, though they did point out that no one on the Hihaun had heard it. Instead, they pointed to the direction of the wind and named several cases where, due to direction of the wind, one ship had not been able to hear another causing a collision. They did emphasize that the Lexham had heard the Hihan, however, and even admitted to hearing her on their starboard side. 
The rules of the road stated that if a ship came to another on her starboard side, it was her duty to change course away from her. Indeed, if a collision had occurred, and the Hihan, who was passing on her port side, had changed direction on hearing the Lexum, the Compania Transatlantica stated that they would feel completely responsible for the accident and bow to the world in apology. It was a strong stance, and they named many examples where such a finding had been held, but the matter would eventually be allowed to rest. It would be six years before a new agreement would be reached in international shipping that it was the duty of a ship on hearing another ship in low visibility to stop her engines entirely until they found where the other ship was. It was six years too late to save the 130 people who were lost with the Lexum and the Hihan. For more information, please see the Flintshire Observer from July 31st, 1884, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.